but eventually obviously they finished their training no more partying and now it's time to fight back to the book fires flickered on the shores of Guadalcanal Island when we came on the deck they were not great flaming leaping fires and we were disappointed we had expected to see the world alight when we emerged from the hatches the bombardment had seemed fierce our um, our ad, armada for such we judged it to be seemed capable of blasting Guadalcanal into perdition but in the dirty dawn of August 7th 1942 there were only a few fires flickering like the city dumps to light our path to history we were apprehensive not frightened so in case you haven't gathered these guys are about to do the landing at Guadalcanal and they get into the the little Higgins boats the little landing craft and here we go the assault began now I was praying again I had prayed much the night before carefully deliberately in in imperating God and the Virgin to care for my family and friends should I fall in the vanity of youth I was positive I would die in the same vanity I was turning my affairs over to the Almighty and I think what he means by vanity that he was sure he would die you'd think somebody that's vain would be like hey I can't be killed but I think what he means by that is the vanity that there's some determined outcome that that you can control or that there's that it's that there's some way it's gonna go right like he's gonna die no you don't even know that right right it's that he knows you know I know yeah 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 exactly I know what's gonna happen I know I'm gonna die that's vanity in its own right that's what he's saying so they hit the landing back to the book but there was no fight the Japanese had run from somewhere came the command move out we formed staggered squads and slogged off we left our innocence on Red Beach it would never be the same they spend a night they're they're, they're now patrolling in and in the night they're they're in security positions and they hear a little gunfire and we're going to the book at dawn we learned the import of the gunfire a medical corpsman had been killed he had been shot by his own men when the sentry had challenged him as he returned from relieving himself he had boggled over the password Lilliputian and so met death eternity at the mercy of a liquid consonant now little heads up Lilliputian is not a good challenge and reply password for everyone else. you don't want to come up with something that's not totally obvious but don't make a guy that's scared out in the middle of the jungle remember the word Lilliputian and and you know we talk about blue on blue there you go like their first casualty is blue on blue their first casualty is blue on blue their first casualty is a guy a, a medic a corpsman being killed by centuries that's a nightmare and <clears throat> I wasn't gonna read this but I'm going to I peered at the captain anxiety was on his face as though carved there by the night's events it startled me here was no warrior no veteran of a hundred battles here was only a civilian like myself here was a man hardly more confident than the trigger happy sentry who had killed the corpsman he was much older than I but the responsibility of his charge the unknown face of war had frightened him past trusting the evidence of his senses so imagine you're going into combat you're in charge you're a civilian but now you're in charge and you're going out on your first combat patrol you lay up and your first thing you do is you kill one of your one of your own guys kills one of your other guys it's a nightmare and he can see it on his face They spend the rest of the day out there, still no heavy enemy contact. Back to the book. That day was a dull, lost witness to the cycle of the sun, of which I have neither memory nor regret. The night I shall never forget. I awoke in the middle of it to see the sky on fire. 
so it seemed. It was like the red mist of my childhood dream when I imagined judgment to have come while I played baseball on the castle grounds at home. We were bathed in red light, as though fixed in the eye of Satan. Imagine a myriad of red traffic lights glowing in the rain, and you will have a replica of the world in which I awoke. The lights were the flares of the enemy. They hung above the jungle roof, swaying gently on their parachutes, casting their red glow about. Motors throbbed above. They were those of Japanese seaplanes, we learned later. We thought they were hunting us. But they were actually the eyes of a mighty enemy naval armada that swept into C. Clark Channel. Soon we heard the sound of cannons and the island trembled beneath us. There came flashes of light, white and red, and great rocking explosions. The Japs were hammering out one of their greatest naval victories. It was the Battle of Savo Island, what we learned to call more accurately the Battle of Four Sitting Ducks. They were sinking three American cruisers, the Quincy, Vincennes, and Astoria, and one Australian cruiser, the Canberra as well as damaging one other American cruiser and a U.S. destroyer. And so they then, during this, they moved towards the beach. And here we go. It was dusk when we reached the beach. We saw wrecked and smoking ships, a clean, unshipped expanse of water between Guadalcanal and Florida Island. Our Navy was gone. Gone. So, if you don't know anything about the Pacific Campaign, you're taking down islands, and your lifeline is the Navy, because that's who's going to bring you ammunition, food, water, gun support, fire support. That's where you're going to take your casualties. So you have total reliance on the Navy. And these guys wake up in the morning, and the Navy's gone, other than sunken ships. Mm Mm-hmm. Horrible. And what what can they do? There's nowhere to run to. You can't back, you can't, there's nowhere to go. The Navy's gone. So they get ordered to take up position where they think an attack might come from. And here we go, back to the book. We were ordered up from the beach to new positions on the west bank of the Tenaru River. Our orders commanded us to urgency. The enemy was expected. The Tenaru River lay green and evil like a serpent across the palmy coastal plain. It was called a river, but it was not a river. Like most of the streams of Oceana, it was a creek, not 30 yards wide. So they're placed there to set security. And they're there for a while. And finally, one night, here we go back to the book. A man says of the eruption of battle, all hell broke loose. The first time he says it, it is true, wonderfully descriptive. The millionth time it is said, it has been worn into meaninglessness. It has gone the way of all good phrasing. It has become cliche. But within five minutes of that first machine gun burst, of the appearance of that first enemy flare that suffused the battlefield in unearthly greenish, greenish light, And by its dying, accentuated the re-enveloping night, within five minutes of this, all hell broke loose. Everyone was firing, every weapon was sounding voice, but this was no orchestration, no terribly beautiful symphony of death, as decadent rear echelon observers write. Here was a cacophony. Here was a cacophony. Here was dissonance. Here was wildness. Here was the absence of rhythm, the loss of limit. For fires, what, when, and where he chooses. Here was booming, sounding, shrinking, wailing, hissing, crashing, shaking, gibberish noise. Here was hell. Yet each weapon had its own sound. And 
it is odd with what clarity the trained ear distinguishes each one and catalogs it, plucks it out of the general din, even though it is intermingled with coincidental with the voice of a dozen others. Even though one's own machine gun spits and coughs and dances and shakes in choleric fury. So it was that our ears pricked, prickled at strange new sounds. The lighter, shingle snap and crack of the Japanese rifle, the gargle of their extremely fast machine guns, the hiccup of their light mortars. And by the way, the movie The Pacific or the, the series The Pacific shows the battle scenes of the Tenaru River and they're phenomenal. Mm-hmm. They, they do a great job of representing what's just what he's talking about right there. Mm-hmm. Back to the book, we dive for our, our holes and gun positions. I jumped the gun. I jumped to the gun with which Chuckler and I had left standing on the bank. I unclamped the gun and fired, spraying my shots as though I were handling a hose. All but one fell. The first fell as though his underpart had been cut from him by a scythe, and the others fell tumbling, screaming. Once again, our gun collapsed, and I grabbed a rifle. I remember it had no sling, which had been left near the gun. The Jap who had survived the, who had survived was deep into the coconuts by the time I found him in the rifle sights. There was his back, bobbing large, and he seemed to be throwing his pack away. Then I fired, and he wasn't there anymore. Perhaps it was not I who shot him, but everyone had found their senses, for not everyone had found their senses and their weapons by then, but I boasted that I had. Perhaps, too, it was a merciful bullet that pounded him between the shoulder blades, for he was fleeing to a certain and horrible end. Black nights, hunger, and slow dissolution in the rainforest. But I had not thought of mercy then. Modern war went forward in the jungle. Men of the 1st Battalion were cleaning up. Sometimes they drove a Japanese toward us. He would cower on the riverbank, hiding, unaware that opposite him were we, already the victors, numerous, heavily armed, lusting for more blood. We killed a few more this way. The fever was on us. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that he's looking back and thinking to himself that when he kills this Japanese soldier, that that was the merciful thing to do. Because he, they haven't suffered yet. Mm. They've been on the island for a few days, even though they're scared, even though they've received fire, they haven't gone to the full length of suffering that they're going to go through. Mm. So when the battle's over, and Lecky gives everyone in the book, he just gives them these really kind of easy to understand nicknames mm. based on their personality. So he talks about this guy here who he calls Lieutenant Ivy League, which <laughs> doesn't take a lot of explanation <laughs> to picture what that guy is like. So here we go back to the book. Lieutenant Ivy League strode up to our pits in the morning. So this is the battle's over. He sat on a coconut log and told us what had happened. He smoked desperately and stared into the river as he talked. The skin around his eyes was drawn tight with strain and with shock. His eyes had already taken on that aspect peculiar to Guadalcanal, that constant stare of pupils that seemed darker, larger, rounder, more absolute. And he kind of gives him a debrief on what happened with the battle, that where the Japanese had come from. And then he says, when he spoke again, it was to tell us who had been killed. There were more than a dozen from H Company, besides more than a score of wounded. Four or five of the dead were from our platoon. Two of them had been hacked to death. A Japanese scouting party had found them asleep in their hole on the riverbank and sliced them into pieces. Our regiment had killed something like 900 of them. Most of them lay in clusters or in heaps before the gun pits commanding the sand spit, as though they had not died singly, but in groups. 
One of the Marines went methodically among the dead armed with a pair of pliers. He had observed that the Japanese have a penchant for gold fillings in their teeth, often for solid gold teeth. He was looting their very mouths. He would kick their jaws agape, peer into the mouth with all the solicitude of a Park Avenue dentist, careful, always careful not to contaminate himself by touch, and yank out all that glittered. He kept the gold teeth in an empty Bull Durham tobacco sack, which he wore around his neck. Souvenirs, we called him. So that's another nickname. He gives, they, get, they call this guy Souvenirs. Now, they're holding in that position, and, and for a few nights, while they were holding this position on the river, they would see, they didn't know what it was, they would see sort of a V in the calm water, they would see like a V, a disturbance in the water, and they couldn't figure out what it was, they were scared out of it. A couple times they shot towards it, they didn't know what it was, they thought it was a, a spy or, or a, a scout trying to check them out, but they were crocodiles. Mm. Back to the book. I took the glasses from him and focused on the opposite shore where I saw a crocodile eating the fat Japanese. I watched in debased fascination, but when the crocodile began to tug at the intestines, I recalled my own presence in that very river hardly an hour ago, and my knees went weak, and I relinquished the glasses. That night, the V reappeared in the river, so they could see the, the little ripple in the river. Everyone whooped and hollered. No one fired. We knew what it was. It was the crocodile. Three smaller Vs trailed afterward, so there's even more crocodiles coming. They kept us awake, crunching. The smell kept us awake. Even though we lay with our heads swathed in a blanket, which was now which was how we kept off the mosquitoes, the smell overpowered us. Smell, the sense which somehow seems a joke, is the one most susceptible to outrage. It will give you no rest. One can close one's eyes to ugliness or shield the ears from sound, but from a powerful smell, there is no recourse but flight. And since we could not flee, we could not escape this smell and we could not sleep. We never fired at the crocodiles, though they returned to the repast day after day until the remains were removed to mass burning and burial, which served as a funeral pyre for the enemy we had annihilated. Our victory in the fight, which we called the Battle of Hell's Point, was not so great as we had imagined it to be. It was to be but one of the many fights for Guadalcanal, and in the end, not the foremost of them. But being the first in our experience, we took it for total triumph. Like those who take the present for the best of all worlds, having no reference to the past, nor regard for the future. It's a mistake we all make. You know, something good happens, and you think, you, you think you're the victor. From the high plateau of triumph, we were about to descend into the depths of trial and tedium. The Japanese attack was to be redoubled and prolonged and varied. It would come from the sky, the sea, and the land. In between every trial, there would stretch out the tedium that sucks a man dry, drawing off the juice from body and soul as a native removes the contents of a stick of sugar cane, leaving it spent, cracked, good for nothing but the flames. And there is terror coming from the interaction of trial and tedium. The first, shaking a man as the wind in the treetops. The second, eroding him as the flood at the roots. So he's got these two things that are working on him. Trial, which is the, the actual fighting, the actual attacks, and tedium, which is the boredom and the waiting. And again, if you watch the Pacific, it does a great job of showing this. And one of the things that really got me when I watched that for the first time is it shows this landing and there's nothing happening. And you're waiting for it to happen. And you know it's going to happen. 
and you're waiting for it and that was a real that 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 I remember that feeling mm-hmm. of being in the streets and you're waiting for it to happen and you're just waiting and it's a it, you want it to happen because right. then you can go yeah let's get it over with yeah but here's he's describing it as like a tree being eroded so the first shaking a man as the wind in the treetops the second so that's that's what that's what the the actual thing does to you it shakes you around but the tedium the second that's the tedium eroding him as the flood at the roots each fresh trial leaves a man more shaken than the last and each period of tedium with its time for speculative dread leaves his foundations worn lower his roots less firm for the next trial Sometimes there is a final shattering, a man crouching in a pit beneath the bombardment of a battleship might put a pistol to his head and deliver himself. Sometimes it is partial. Another man might break at the sound of a diving enemy plane and scream and shudder and wring his hands and rise to run. This is the terror I meant this is the terror that strangles reason with the clawing hands of panic I saw it twice I felt it pluck at me twice but it was rare it claimed few victims so so that's a really I think that's just a phenomenal way to understand what these guys were going through the waiting and then the trial and then the waiting and then the trial and that's a great description speculative dread just just thinking about okay what's the next attack gonna be like are we gonna be able to get through it and you know he's talking about guys killing themselves yeah. being so they just can't take it anymore yeah. they can't take it anymore and the only way out they can figure is to kill themselves which is just a, it's horrible horrible thing a lot of times criminals will do that like if they're on their like fugitives if they're on the run true yeah and they're like when are they gonna break down my door and find me and they get that speculative dread and they just turn themselves in right or i thought you were gonna say that sometimes you know guys once they're surrounded by the swat team oh yeah, that yeah then they sure. just know there's they just can't take it anymore they kill themselves yeah i feel like that's more of them like I'd rather die than go to jail almost kind of thing. But that speculative dread that you're talking about. Yeah. Even in like jujitsu tournaments, you know, when you're waiting around like, oh, am I up? Am I up? That's that's like can be part of the chat. I mean, waiting. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously way more lighthearted than this, but you know, this and and he so he says this and he says it it claimed few victims, meaning it didn't actually most guys sucked it up and you're going to hear him, you know, because he says he felt it. Yeah. Twice. It plucked at him twice. But it wasn't, it was rare. He says it, but it was rare. And then he says, courage was commonplace. So that was what was normal. What was normal was courage. And this is just such a good paragraph or two here. Courage was, was a commonplace. It formed a club or corporation, much as do those other common things upon which men, for diverse reasons, place so great a value, like money, like charity. For it is in the common on which the exclusive rests. Our muddy machine gun pits were transformed into courage clubs. When bombs fell or Japanese warships pounded us from the sea, there was protocol to be observed too, and it was natural that the poor fellow who might break into momentary terror should cause pained silences and embarrassed coughs. Everyone looked the other way, like millionaires confronted by the horrifying sight of a club member borrowing $5 from the waiter. And then he says this, but there was a bit more charity in our clubs, I think. We were not quite so puffed up that we could not recognize the ugly thing on our friend's face as the elder brother of the thing fluttering within our own innards. You today 
me tomorrow. And that's such a powerful thing to think about. When you see someone going through some trouble, to be able to recognize like, hey, got you know, Echo's going through some issues right now, and I'm not looking down at you. I'm not judging you. I'm recognizing that what you're going through today mm-hmm. could be what I go through tomorrow. And they all felt, he felt that, you know, I see Echo losing it and, and curling into a ball and not wanting to fight. And I recognize that as the older brother of the thing that I actually feel too. Mm-hmm. But I've got it under control today. Yeah. Tomorrow I might not, but today I got it under control. That's why I'm not looking down my nose at you and that's why I'm not judging you. And I think that forms such a tight bond that these guys had, you know, these guys had respect, enough respect and enough mercy on each other yeah. to say, look, Echo's having a hard time right now. It's okay. We're going to get him through today. Mm. I'm not going to look down on him. And tomorrow it might be me and he's not going to look down on me. Yeah. Powerful stuff. We tend to judge. Yeah. Especially... Yeah, it, is, it seems like they so they can relate. You know, like Echo's at level eight right now; he's losing it. I'm over at level two, yep. and luckily I can keep the two inside. You know, yeah. But I don't even know when two's going to yeah. become eight Yesterday or ten. Yesterday I was at one, yeah. so I could very well be at you know eight. But the tomorrow. idea that when you're dealing with other people, you try and have their perspective, you try and take their perspective and understand what they're going through, and have empathy for what's happening to them. Powerful. Yeah, man. Instead, we tend so often just to want to judge. Yeah. Judge. Back to the book. At night, washing machine Charlie picked up the slack. Washing machine, washing machine Charlie, so named for the sound of his motors, was the nocturnal marauder who prowled our skies. So these are Japanese bombers. Like the dog whose bark is worse than its bite, the throb of Charlie's motors was more fearsome than the thump of his bombs. Charlie did not kill many people, but like Macbeth, he murdered sleep. To these trials was added the worst ordeal, shelling from the sea. Enemy warships, usually cruisers, sometimes battleships, stand off your coast. It is night, and you cannot see them, nor could you if it were day, as they are miles and miles away. We could see the flashes of the guns far out to sea. We heard the soft papoom, papoom of their salvos. Then, rushing through the night, straining like an airy boxcar, came the huge projectiles. The earth rocks and shakes upon the terrifying crash of the detonation, though it be hundreds of yards away. Your stomach is squeezed as though a monster, a monster hand were kneading it into dough. You gasp for breath like a football player who falls heavily and has the wind knocked out of him. Flash. Ba-boom. They're lowering their sights. It's coming closer. Oh, that one was close. The sandbags are falling. I can't hear it. I can't hear the shell. It's the one you don't hear, they say. The one you don't hear. Where is it? Where is it? Flash. Ba-boom. Thank God. It's lifted. It's going the other way. It's daylight now, and there are only the bombings to worry about. And the heat. And the mosquitoes. And the rice lying in our bellies like stones so again the the unknown and uncontrollable experience of getting you know hit with mortars or artillery or in this case naval gunfire and again there's no US Navy out there they're just having their way it's a nightmare they continue to press on but things are not looking good. Back to the book. Everyone kept saying, hopefully, that the army was coming in next week to relieve us. Everyone was in despair. We heard that the army relief force had been destroyed at sea. Chuckler and I visited the cemetery. It lay to the south off the coastal road that ran from east to west through the coconuts. We knelt to pray before the graves of the men we had known. 
Only palm fronds marked the place where they were buried, although here and there were rude crosses on which were nailed the men's identification tags. Some of the crosses bore mess gear tins affixed to the wood like rude medallions, and on those the Marines had lovingly carved their epitaphs. He died fighting. A real Marine. A big guy with a bigger heart. Our buddy. The harder the going, the more cheerful he was. There was also this verse, which I had seen countless times before and since. The direct and unpolished cry of a Marine's sardonic heart. And when he gets to heaven, so St. Peter he will tell. One more Marine reporting, sir. I've served my time in hell. Now part of that, part of that despair that they felt came from the fact that they began to feel expendable. Then he goes into that here. All armies have expendable items. That is a part or a unit, the destruction of which will not be fatal to the whole. In some ordeals, a man might consider his finger expendable but not his hand, or, in extremity, his arm, but not his heart. There are expendable items which may be lost or destroyed in the field, either in war or in peace, without their owner being required to replace them. A rifle is so expendable, or a cartridge belt. So are men. Men are the most expendable of all. Hunger, the jungle, the Japanese. Not one nor all of these could be quite as corrosive as the feeling of expendability. This was no feeling of dedication because it was absolutely involuntary. I do not doubt that if Marines had asked for volunteers for an impossible campaign such as Guadalcanal, almost everyone now fighting would have stepped forward. But that is sacrifice. That is voluntary. Being expended robs you of that exaltation, the self-abnegation, the absolute freedom of self-sacrifice. Being expended puts one in the role of victim rather than sacrificer. And there is always something begrudging in this. So, luckily, they do end up getting some help, getting relieved. The army shows up to help them out, and here we go. So we were glad to see the soldiers when they came trudging up to our pits. They came after another air raid, a very close one. But the thing had not infected them yet. War was still a lark. Their faces were still heavy with flesh, their ribs padded, their eyes innocent. They were older than we, and averaged 25 to our average 20. Yet we treated them like children. Now, even though they get relieved, they're still working and still fighting and they're still suffering. Back to the book, we were growing irritable. Our strength was being steadily sapped and a sort of physical depression afflicted many of us. The rain, the rainy season was upon us. On our exposed ridge, it fell upon us in torrents. A man was drenched in seconds, his teeth chattering and his hands darting swiftly to his precious cigarettes, transferring them to the safety of his helmet liner, cursing bitterly if he had waited too long before becoming conscious of their peril. After cigarettes, we were concerned about our ammunition. On the downward slope of the hill, the rainwater ran into our pits and holes as though they were sewer receivers. We had to dash for the pits and lift the boxes of machine gun belts out of the water's way, piling them atop one another on the earthen gun platform. 
any dry place in the pit was reserved for ammunition. He who sought refuge from the rain had to sit on the water cans. There were whole days of downpour where I lay drenched and shivering, gazing blankly out of my hole, watching as the sheeted gray rain whipped and, and undulated over the ridge. At such times, a man's brain seems to cease to function. It seems to retreat into a depth, much as the red corpuscles retreat from the surface of the body in times of excitement. One ceases to be rational. One becomes only sedent, like a barnacle clinging onto a ship. One is aware only of life, of wetness, of the cold gray rain. But without this automatic retreat of reasons, a man can go only one way. He can only go mad. Certain level of detachment there. <laughs> just checking out. Just checking out. You're just there, but you're not there. Mm. Good place to, it's a good place to visit sometimes. You know, I don't think you want to live there. You certainly no. don't want to live there, but it's a good place to visit. Why? I just think, I think it's important to get to a point where you're just detaching from your physical suffering and your physical pain and you just say, you know what? I'm just turned off. And you just retreat, like he said, you just retreat into almost like nothingness. Mm-hmm. I think it's important. Maybe to gain clarity or something. Yeah, I think some you gain some clarity and I think it's a I think it's a very important defense mechanism to have. Oh yeah. Huh? You know, sometimes when you're doing stuff, uh, you just have to do it. Like you can't think about it anymore. You yeah. just have to turn your brain off and go. Yeah. And I think that's what that's what he's talking about right there. Yeah. He's not he's not participating in it. Yeah. He's just detaching from it and doing what he's got to do. His body is doing what he's got to do. Huh. Now, they, <laughs> they're, they're, this whole time they're expecting to be relieved. They're expecting to get, get pulled off the island. Mm. And one of the sergeants comes out and, and makes an announcement to him. Stand by to move out in the morning. Yeah, we moving out into a new offensive <laughs> get all your foul weather gear ready and be sure your guns is oiled up and your ammunition belts dry eight marines will be up to relieve us in the morning so they, they they think they're gonna get relieved and go to a ship and relax and get 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 into get some relief that's what relief is right mm. but they get told no you're going on a new offensive So they're in, well, here, going back to the book. After nearly five months, by the way, a lot of times you think of the island campaigns in Japan, these are little islands, you know, 10 miles long. You think, oh, that probably took a week, two weeks, five months. After nearly five months, this. Runner, and he's gonna name all the different guys, the different nicknames, you can hear him. Runner had malaria. Brick barely stirred from the pit except at night. Hoosier and Oak Stump were subject to long periods of depression. Red had long since left us. I had dysentery. Chuckler was irritable. All of us were emaciated and weakened beyond measure. But we were to move out on the attack. We could not move to Chow without gasping for breath, but we were to move on the enemy. We despaired. In the morning, we crouched by our guns and waited for the order to dismantle them and move out. It did not come. Nor did it come the next day or the next, and hope came creeping back, blushing, ashamed of her loyal dis- of her disloyal flight, but commending herself to us once more with the promise never again to desert the ramparts. <laughs> 